The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. For nearly three decades, San Mateo County has been led by the steady, creative, and thoughtful management of John Maltby. But he's retiring at the end of the year. We've got him here to talk about where he's going and where the county is going. The game is government. The game is on. Hi, I'm Kevin Mullen. And I'm Mark Simon. Welcome to the game. Since 1989, San Mateo County has transformed from a quiet suburban community to a very diverse economic powerhouse, but with an ever-increasing array of urban challenges, homelessness, a jobs housing imbalance, and unprecedented congestion byproducts of that economic activity. But one constant through all these changes has been County Manager John Maltby, who joins us on the game. After we talk with John, we will de debut a new feature, A Few Minutes with Kevin. At the end of the show, we'll turn Kevin from co-host into guest, take a few minutes to get his perspective and analysis on the latest political news here at home and in Sacramento. But first, John Maltby, who announced he is retiring at the end of the year after 27 years leading the county government. As he steps down, the county has an annual budget of $2.82 billion in more than 5,500 employee positions. He served as county manager from 1980. Uh, nine to 2008, retired and then was asked back by the county supervisors, first on an interim basis in 2011 and then permanently in 2012. This time he plans on staying retired. John, welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. My pleasure, Mark. Talk, talk a little bit. You've been a lifelong public servant. You were a city manager before you did this. You worked at the county of Santa Clara before this. Tell us a little bit about why you've decided to retire. Well, I think at age 70, uh, it's probably uh, due some might say long overdue. Yeah. Um, and I want to spend more time with my family and, and do uh, some of the things that you just can't do when you work uh, 60 hours a week. Uh, uh, so I, I think that uh, it, the county's uh, in a good position. I think that it's a uh, right time for me to retire. And I think that the, um, uh, the future is going to be bright both for me and the county. Well, let's talk a little bit. What is the state of the county at this point in time? We, we, uh, in the top of the show, Kevin laid out a series of problems. I know that you're well aware of them. Um, the county is really sort of the, at the fulcrum of a lot of those problems. So what is the state of the county? Well, I, I think the state of the county from a, a, a financial standpoint is very sound. Um, uh, measure A, Measure K, uh, the, the, the sales tax, half cent sales tax measure approved by the voters several years ago is certainly provided resources to the county. We continue to get resources through uh, additional property taxes uh, as a result of the high wealth uh, in, in this area. Um, and obviously the problems that we're experiencing are problems that really are an outcome of the prosperity that this area that has enjoyed for many years now, Kevin alluded to them. Um, and they're not inconsiderable problems, but there are problems that probably a lot of the rest of the country would gladly change in a heartbeat, uh, given the, the fact that we have a very low unemployment rate. We live in a wonderful, wonderful area. Uh, and uh, even with the problems we have, uh, I think we're still doing pretty well. How has county government had to change? As we described the changes that have taken place over the last three decades. How has, how has county government changed during your tenure? Well, I, I think the, the biggest change probably in county government um, is the emphasis that we now have on housing and transportation. Those aren't two problems that necessarily are one of the core services that the county provides. Obviously, for those 80,000 people that live in the unincorporated area, we're their city government, and so housing uh, is an issue, but for the most part, that's pretty rural, except in a few urban pockets uh, on the bay side of the county. Transportation really is is an issue of city government, the uh, Samtrans, Caltrain, BART, um, all of the uh, agencies in the Bay Area that, that provide those services. But as we've all come to learn, 
housing and transportation are sort of the same end of the of, of the of the rope, but different ends of the of the rope. And you can't talk about one without talking about the other. And so county government has been much more involved, I think, in most of those in, in those two issues than certainly at the beginning of my tenure. Mm -hmm. John, can I ask you, <clears throat> you mentioned the housing challenge and some of those external sort of policy challenges that the that the county deals with internally in terms of how you manage the city and how you manage the county and how you recruit a workforce. Have you seen uh, those challenges uh, increase in terms of getting a talent pool to, to fill uh, county positions? Is it an attractive place uh, to work? It's a, it's a financially sound county, but has the housing crisis made that more difficult uh, for you? I know the county's done quite a bit on succession planning and, and getting that kind of next generation ready to, to take over, but how has that housing crisis and the cost of living challenge in this county affected your ability to recruit and retain? Well, clearly for the county, I suspect all the city governments in the county, school districts, um, housing is just a critical, critical element in attracting and retaining employees. Um, take position of deputy sheriff. We pay a deputy journeyman deputy sheriff um, over $100,000 in salary with benefits, probably close to $200,000. I think by anybody's standard, that's that's pretty good money. And yet, I could almost um, chart the tenure of a deputy sheriff uh, by where they are in their life cycle. We'll hire a young person as a deputy sheriff. Um, they may be single, they may have a partner, uh, but they could provide for their housing in this area when they're when they're hired. Um, somewhere along the line, uh, many of the deputies get married. Uh, and then the uh, awful moment comes when they have a child. Uh, <laughs> that child then uh, puts into play a number of elements, most of which is, we want a house. Yeah. And they start looking around and there are no houses available, even at that salary level. And so they finally find a house in Manteca. Now deputy sheriffs are pretty smart people. And they drive past 20, 25 police agencies four days a week coming to work. Pretty soon the light bulb goes on. I could get a job a lot closer to home, and they do. And that's just one example. We face it with, with nurses, we face it with social workers. I know the school districts face it with teachers. Uh, all of the public employees that we all depend on, on a daily basis, either have to live a long ways from where they work, or pay a disproportionate share of their income for salary. And when you start thinking about emergency service workers, and you think about the next big earthquake, and you think that they live in Manteca, they're not going to be able to get back to work. That's true for firefighters, police officers, paramedics, nurses, you name it. Does, is there a similar problem with the, sort of the upper level executives um, at, at the, the county, which is that you're competing against uh, some of the major employers in the area, and, and either you have to find somebody who's already here, because if you try to bring them in from outside the area, when I worked at Samtrans not too long ago, we had the problem all the time, which is we'd, we'd recruit somebody, they'd actually take the job, they'd come out, they'd take one look around at the housing and see if they could renegotiate a better deal back right. where they were. Right. Well, I think Kevin alluded to it a moment ago when we talked about succession planning. Um, it's clear to me that for county government and I think uh, any other executive level positions uh, in cities and school districts and, and, and transportation agencies, we have to grow our own because it is going to be increasingly difficult to be able to pay the types of salary that you need or provide the housing package that you need in order to attract uh, the type of talent uh, that this area has been so blessed with for so many years from an executive standpoint. And compounding that now is the changes in retirement law a few years ago that limit the amount of retirement compensation that re executives can receive. So you start to put all of those factors together and what we've put a lot of emphasis in is really uh, finding really bright, capable people and getting them in the organization, putting, giving them a lot of opportunities to grow and develop and, and train. Uh, and, and we have, I think, in San Mateo County's case, because of that, uh, been able to uh, have a cadre of people 
that are ready to step up to the next level of uh, leadership. For instance, Assistant uh, uh, County Manager Mike Calgi, a um, number of departmental directors. Uh, they're, they're, they're all in, in leadership positions and ready to take on additional challenges. We're going to take a break. Uh, you stick around and you do the same. We'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo First opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. He's Kevin Mullen. And over here is John Maltby. Since 1989-ish, he's been our county manager and he's retiring at the end of the year. Hopefully sooner than that if the Board of Supervisors finishes the much vaunted nationwide search for the successor when there's a good chance they'll find one in their own backyard. We were talking about the housing problem, how it's affected uh, the county's ability to, to attract and retain people. Uh, what's the solution, or is there one? You and I have been in other conversations and other contexts in which you've raised doubts about whether or not it's even possible to build enough housing to really affect the cost of housing and the supply in this area. And yet you see cities, you see uh, school districts like the community colleges uh, really pushing hard for a lot more housing than this county used to be, uh, used to be accustomed to. Well, I, I think you have to look at the geography of the county. Um, 80% of the county is in permanent open space, whether it's owned by the county or the state or it's farm, land, or for whatever reason, the city and county of San Francisco. It's an open space. That's not going to change. The people of this county love that about, about our county. So now you have to start looking at, okay, where do you put new housing? You put it primarily on the bay side, and that means really redeveloping areas because the bay side is basically built out as well. And that comes with a whole set of challenges. Most of the people that live in this county today like the way it is today. And so as, as Mark, you know well with the challenges that Samtrans had in building additional housing uh, along uh, the rail corridor, um, whenever a high density project is proposed, there's going to be a group of people that oppose it. Um, some for good reasons, some for spurious reasons, but they'll oppose it. So that makes the political challenge of building housing difficult. Also, we have to consider the fact that there's infrastructure. Our infrastructure in this county was designed for single family residential housing. You start putting a lot of high density housing, even in areas along rail corridors, you've got challenges with sewer, with water, and of course street transportation of cars, even if a lot of people take public transportation. All those, I think, are limiting factors in us being able to build enough housing to moderate the rate of increase of housing, not to drive the cost of housing down, just to moderate it. Uh, and so uh, I think we have to be realistic and, and do what we can, and we are. Uh, the cities and the county collectively are doing a lot. But at the end, I think we have to realize that uh, given the amount of jobs we have in this county, there's always going to be a lot of people that are going to be commuting into this county. And so we have to build the types of transportation systems in the region that will get people to and from their work as quickly as possible so that more people can have housing uh, in Tracy, in Manteca, uh, in the East Bay, and yet not waste two, three hours uh, a day on the roads. They could get to work quickly and go home quickly. I think ultimately that's going to be a big part of the solution. Now I want to say one other thing about housing we haven't touched on, which I think is, is also important and, and it's going to be increasingly important. The cost of housing in this county is going to result in, at a very rapid rate, the gentrification of the county. We're seeing it in areas like North Fair Oaks, a largely Hispanic community. <clears throat> Uh, but it will occur all over the county, and that's going to change the nature of the county considerably. 
the demographics will change, as well as the, the incomes of people that live here. Uh, and I think we need to, to, to give a lot of thought uh, to that because the, the county 20 years from now is not going to look anything like it looks today. Well, how do you think it's going to change? I mean, we, one of the things everybody likes a lot is the, the ethnic diversity of the county. Is that one of the things that is going to That's one of the things I predict is going to change. The, the, the ratio of children to adults. Let me give you one small example. Ten years ago, we built a brand new juvenile youth center. We used to call them juvenile halls. Yeah. Um, it had uh, approximately 160 beds. And when it opened, it was relatively full. Today, in an average day, it has 60 kids in it. Now, I would like to think that kids are behaving themselves a lot more today. And I think maybe that partially may be true. But I think the result is there's just fewer kids living here and thus fewer kids getting in trouble. Yeah. We see that in our, some of our social services caseloads today. That's, that's happening uh, at an increasing rate, and, and, and I think it's going to be manifest in a number of different ways. The, the types of people that we depend on on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the nannies, the gardeners, the daycare workers, uh, the people that, that work in the shops, and, and, and all of the, the things that you don't really give a second thought to, but they make your life easier, those people are going to be harder and harder to get. I know uh, I regularly eat uh, at a restaurant in San Carlos, so I give them a plug, town. Um, they have a harder and harder time getting the types of folks that they need to work there. And, and it's a function of the cost of housing. So John, as you reflect on your tenure, uh, focusing on the role of city manage, of county manager, what has been the biggest challenge? Has it been in, internally dealing with a board as elected board, um, managing all these different departments that have competing needs? And what would be the one piece of advice that you have to your successor about how to deal with that biggest challenge? Well, the, the, the biggest challenge is, is um, keeping everyone on the same page. Uh, the county has um, a number of core services, all of which are, crim uh, are critical. Criminal justice services, health services, social services. And those have competing demands, uh, sometimes with overlapping clientele, sometimes with different clientele. And they have different perspectives because of those different demands in trying to allocate the appropriate resources and keep them focused on some countywide issues and moving in the same direction without getting siloed. Uh, and, and, you know, siloing begins with streams of money from the federal and state government to specific programs. It begins with um, uh, regulations that say that you have to keep certain information confidential when you have to work together. All of those things create these silos and, and keeping that, those lines of communications as open and free-flowing as possible for the benefit of the clients that they serve uh, has always been the, uh, the, the number one challenge. Let me ask you, um, we're running out of time. This time's gone by very quickly. How has district elections changed the nature of the county and the board of supervisors? I, I think we're beginning to see the, the nature changes. Most of the members of the Board of Supervisors were elected uh, at large. Uh, I think Supervisor Canepa is the first one that has been elected uh, uh, as a new board member under district elect elections. But I, I saw even before Supervisor Canepa's election that there is a greater focus on districts and maybe um, somewhat less of a focus on countywide issues, and I think that's, that's to be uh, expected. The nature of a lot of what counties do, however, is really countywide. I mean, right. you know, healthcare doesn't know any boundaries. When somebody gets sick in Woodside uh, and they stand in the grocery store next to somebody in North Fair Oaks and give them the flu, it doesn't make any difference where you live. And, and a n number of county services are of that nature. So I think to keep the board focused on countywide issues uh, is going to be a challenge not only for my successor, but I think a challenge for the supervisors themselves to find a balance between addressing the needs of their district that are legitimate and yet maintaining a countywide focus. John Maltby, thank you for being with us. I think we're going to have to have you back before the year's out because yes. there's a lot of stuff we didn't cover. But thank you for being with us and thank you for your service to this county over these many years. 
After the break, we'll come back for a few minutes with Kevin Mullen. Stick around. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo First opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. You know, one of the great joys for me on this show has been to have as my partner, Kevin Mullen, not just because he's a good friend, but because he's also one of the region's leading political figures and president, uh, speaker pro tem of the state assembly and uh, our state assemblyman. So we're going to take advantage of that with a new feature in which we talk with Kevin at the end of every show. We call it A Few Minutes with Kevin. So thanks for switching from, uh, from uh, shooter to target. Honored to be here. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we got to talk a little bit about some of the things John Maltby said, because I think um, he touched on a lot of issues that you're also wrestling with at a state level, but the local government's always the, the most fascinating one. Yeah. Um, any reflections first on some of the things you heard from John? Well, <clears throat> we were joking before we did the taping that he's kind of like the Jerry Brown of San Mateo County. He had that initial stint and then came back for uh, an encore performance. Um, you don't see county managers stay in that role as long as he has. I think it's relatively unique. And I think what's pretty clear is he's had the confidence of shifting personalities on that elected board of supervisors over that entire tenure, which speaks to his ability to work with, uh, with those elected officials in a way that they really have confidence in his ability. And it's mostly, I would say, probably fiscal management. This county is very uh, well managed fiscally and has uh, prepaid pension obligations and those kinds of things. And the voters of the county have been very generous. So he really leaves the county in a strong, stable place, which really you know, speaks to his management uh, Abilities. We talked a lot during the, the interview about housing and transportation. Those are two issues you're wrestling with. And John, John was very, very direct about he doesn't think there is a solution. And he's, I don't know if worried is the right word, but he's concerned about how it's going to change the county into a really different place, uh, you know, almost sort of a wealthy enclave. Yeah. Um, do you have the same concerns? Uh, well, do you, I, do you yeah. are a little more optimistic perhaps than he is? I will try to remain optimistic about that challenge because we've done some things at the state level in terms of streamlining the development of affordable housing, creating a funding stream for affordable housing. But you do all of these uh, different things, you move the needle a little bit. We still have, even when um, these policies take hold, a major jobs housing imbalance, which, which really speaks to the nature of the job creation in this county, 2.2% unemployment, I think it is. Unbelievable. The job creation is just, you know, off the hook right now. And it's just very hard given the, the nature of housing development and the, and the length of time it takes to get these projects activated to try to come up with any kind of balance there. So I think this is a perpetual challenge. Uh, we just try to mitigate it with policies at the state level and the local level and uh, build along transit corridors. But to his point, it's really about how do we regionally work our transportation network where the housing is, is cheaper than it is here and bring those workers in to the job centers of the West Bay. Mm -hmm. And that kind of east-west uh, connection is where we have to go as a region. Uh, in the meantime, we have to do what we can to uh, increase the supply of affordability, affordable housing here uh, on the El Camino Real up and down the peninsula. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about 2018. Uh, it's everybody in the pool election. Yeah. We got all the local elections have been merged with with right. the local with the with the statewide election. Plus, we've got a, a governor's race, we've got a senate race, we've got probably two or three major uh, ballot measures, including one to undo um, some of the things that were done with the uh, the gas tax. Um, how do you see 2018 shaping up, and what kind of political year? Well, this is going to be an abnormal off-year election. This 2018 is going to feel a lot like a presidential election, just in terms of the intensity, the attention on politics. It's the nature of sort of the reaction to Trump 
the Trump presidency in California, you have uh, a huge swath of candidates that are rushing into these congressional seats that are so-called purple seats that are in play at the congressional level and, and to some degree. Uh, at the state level, so uh, I know we're going going to be doing an election night yes, show. We it is, it's we, going to be we full can't tilt. Resist, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be full tilt. Uh, the merging of the local elections really adds a different element, uh, where that ballot will be very long. I'm concerned a little bit about ballot drop off, where voters may have fatigue by the time they get to their local. Uh, races, but um, and it changes the nature of those local races too, because they now have to communicate with a larger pool of voters who come out in gubernatorial and presidential years. So uh, a lot to look at, but intensity is the word. I've never seen it quite like this, and I've been in politics for over 20 years, so it's going to be a, quite a year. And that's all we have time for. Kevin, thank you for doing this. I'm Mark Simon. And I'm Kevin Mullen. Thank you for being with us, and join us next time on The Game.